Hi and welcome. Today we are going to start a new series of macrobiology. We are starting with the introduction of macrobiology. And so this is going to be our outline and this is going to be our learning objectives. Now when we say micro, it means something which is extremely small. Biology, let's break it into two. We have bio means life, logy means study. And so biology is the study of life and the processes associated with living things. And so when you combine the two, macrobiology is the area of biology that deals with living things, which are microorganisms, too small to be seen without uh, magnification. Now, life as it is has certain characteristics which you need to know. And so the first of it is reproduction. And this is the ability of the organism to make copies of itself or to reprocreate. And this can be done either sexually or asexually. Now, the second characteristic of life is growth, which is the ability uh, of the organism to follow specific instructions which are coded by their genes. And so, at the end of the day, the young will grow and exhibit similar characteristics like their parents. Now, the third uh, characteristic we need to know is order. And as we know, organisms are highly organized structures that are made of one or more cells. And so, when we look inside each cell, we have atoms coming together to make molecules, and this in turn make up cell organelles. And especially when we look at multicellular organisms, what we find is uh, similar cells will come together to form tissues, tissues will come together to form uh, organs, and the organs will also combine to form the organ system, such as the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the digestive system. The next characteristic of life is uh, response, that is the ability to respond to stimulus in the organism's environment, and this is crucial uh, in order for it to survive. For example, plants uh, do bend towards sources of light, especially uh, for photosynthesis. Bacteria can also move away from chemicals. So these are characteristics which are necessary for the survival of uh, the organism. Now, we also have metabolism, and this is the ability uh, of the organism to break down large molecules into smaller ones and also bring smaller molecules together to form large ones in order to produce energy. Now, in short, when we say metabolism, we are talking about all the chemical processes that take place in the body. For example, if you eat protein-rich diet, the body breaks it down into smaller amino acids. And this is what we refer to as catabolism. And when you take all these amino acids and assemble them you know, into human proteins and use these uh, you know, uh, smaller molecules to build large ones, then we call it anabolism. So catabolism is to break down into smaller particles, whilst anabolism is to form, to make bigger particles. The next one is uh, homeostasis. When we say homeostasis, it means a steady state, uh, which is the ability of the organism to maintain a constant internal environment. That is, we say homeostasis is to ensure a dynamic equilibrium. We say dynamic because the body keeps changing and adjusting itself to its changing environment. We say equilibrium because the body functions in specific ranges or we have certain normal limits or set points that the body functions in. For example, we have normal body temperature, we have normal blood pressure, we have normal pulse. So these are specific ranges that the body must you know, work within. And this will send us to uh, some types of homeostatic mechanisms. And so we have two main of them. We have the negative feedback mechanism and we have the positive feedback mechanism. Now, when we talk about negative feedback uh, mechanism, all that we are saying is 
there is a stimulus or something is going on in the body. And for example, if it is pain, in negative feedback mechanism, the pain is either increased or it is decreased. And so the body does not allow the stimulus to continue as it started before. In other words, if the level of the pain is too high, the body does something to bring it down. And if the level of the stimulus is too low, the body does something to bring it up. Hence, we have the term negative uh, feedback mechanism. And a typical example is what we have on the screen using thermoregulation. And so, as uh, we have the body temperature to be normal, to be between 36.1 to 37.2. Any temperature which is below 36.1 is said to be abnormal. And any temperature which is below um, or which is above 37.2, we say it's high. And so, for example, if you have a temperature of 38.4 degrees Celsius, what happens is the body, um, the, the skin has uh, uh, sensory receptors which senses this rise in the body temperature. So sense impulses to the brain, which causes the blood vessels in the skin to dilate. And so as they dilate, it results in heat loss to the environment. That's not all. The sweat glands also secrete fluid in the form of sweat. And as the fluid evaporates, heat is lost from the body. And so heat is lost to the environment and the body temperature returns to normal. And so we see there is homeostasis. There is a steady state. On the other hand, if the body temperature is too low, that is, let's say, a body temperature of about 34.5 degrees Celsius, Sensory receptors in the skin sense it again and sense impulse to the brain, which now causes the blood vessels to constrict, thereby conserving heat in the body. The sweat glands do not secrete uh, 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 sweat or fluid, so they conserve the fluid. And now the body also causes shivering, which is a mechanism to generate heat in the body and so heat is generated and the body becomes warm so we retain the heat and the body temperature rises to normal state and so this is a simple uh, way by which the body maintains homeostasis and this is just one of the examples other examples of negative feedback mechanism is the control of blood pressure we also have the body uh, pH and also um, when we are controlling um, uh, uh, sugar levels, that is the uh, blood sugar uh, levels. Now, the other type of hum uh, homeostatic mechanism is what we call the positive feedback mechanism. And positive feedback mechanism, what happens is that the stimulus is rather intensified. So, and so if it is pain, the pain is going to be intensified. And so we have intensification of the stimulus. Now, what happens is that instead of reversing the stimulus, we rather promote or enhance the stimulus. So if it is pain, the pain becomes more. And this is why we say positive feedback mechanism is normal only when there is a definite endpoint. And so positive feedback mechanism must have a definite endpoint. If not, the organism will die. And so it is only there and used only when or they are activated, only when uh, it is needed. And, it, uh, and we have two of such examples to be uh, in labor, that's child delivery, and also uh, the blood clotting system in our body. And so as we have on the screen, we are going to use this to explain the positive feedback mechanism. And so in labor, what happens is that 
there is uterine contraction, which is the stimulus. And this uterine contraction pushes the baby towards the cervix. And so as the baby moves towards the cervix, the cervix begins to stretch or dilate and it's taken up. Now this stretching of the cervix sends impulses to the brain and uh, the brain in turn um, causes the pituitary gland to release oxytocin into the blood. Now this oxytocin which uh, is released into uh, the blood causes even more stronger uterine contractions thereby pushing the baby further down the uh, birth canal. Now what happens is that the cycle of stretching, oxytocin release and increased contractions stops only when the baby is out of the birth canal and so this is why we say the stimulus is enhanced other than reversed and so once the baby is out at this point there is not going to be any stretching of the cervix the oxytocin release is also going to stop so this is a typical example of positive feedback mechanism as we know now after knowing these let's quickly move on to look at the types of microorganisms so we have the bacteria we have the fungi we have the archaea we have the algae protozoa then we have the helminths and viruses. Now, all of these microorganisms may be cellular or acellular. When we say cellular microorganisms, we mean they are made up of cells. And acellular microorganisms means they are not made up of cells. And so the cellular microorganisms may be unicellular, that is, they have only one single cell, or they may be multicellular, which means they have multiple cells. And um, most uh, of these uh, microorganisms are unicellular. Example, we have bacteria to be unicellular, uh, whereas we have fungi to be multicellular. Now, the cellular microorganisms may also be, or the, ce the cellular organisms may also be prokaryotic or eukaryotic. And when we say prokaryotic, we only mean that these cells have a nucleus. And uh, rather the lack membrane bound organelles uh, and also they are there without covering. The opposite is that of the eukaryotic cells which have a true nucleus, they also have uh, membrane bound uh, organelles and they have uh, a true cell membrane of a wall, cell wall. Now let's look more into the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic cells. Example uh, would be bacteria, as we mentioned. In the bacteria may be either circular, which you call cocci, or they may be rod, which you call the bacilli. We also have uh, actinomycetes, which shares characteristics with bacteria and fungi. Then eukaryotic cells, we have all animals, plants, fungi, and many unicellular organisms being eukaryotic. And so we have fungi, we have algae, we have protozoa, and all of these may be free uh, living or parasitic. And we have helminths, which may also be free living or parasitic. And so examples of the helminths, we have the flukes, which are the trematodes, we have the cystodes or the tapeworms, then we also have the roundworms or the nematodes. Now these are specific characteristics uh, of prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells and the similarities uh, or the similarities which uh, they share and so as you can see the prokaryotic cells tends to be smaller and simple whilst that of the eukaryotic cells are much larger and complex and as you can see their sizes range from 0 0.1 to 5 in prokaryotic and 10 to 100 in um, uh, eukaryotic so importantly you must know that they are unicellular as a prokaryotic whilst the eukaryotic can be unicellular or multicellular. The prokaryotics do not uh, have a nucleus whilst the eukaryotic cells have nucleus present. Their DNA is circular in prokaryotics whilst it is linear in eukaryotics. These ones have single chromosomes and the eukaryotics uh, have uh, double or you know, uh, uh, diploid chromosomes. Like we said, the lack membrane bound organelles, that's the prokaryotics. Then we have uh, the eukaryotics having uh, membrane bound organelles. 
the prokaryotic cells produce both sexually and asexually, whilst the eukaryotic cells usually produce sexually. Now, their cell division is by binary fusion, which I'm going to explain very soon, and that of the eukaryotic cells are by mitosis. And examples are what you've seen before, the bacteria and also the archaea. Then examples of the eukaryotic cells, you have the plants, you have the animal cells, and we have humans. All of us are eukaryotic cells. Now, when we pick the eight cellular microorganisms, we say they are eight cellular and so they are not made up of cells. Now, because they are not having any distinct cell wall or cell membrane, we say they are non-living. In other words, we say they are obligate intracellular organisms. So, uh, obligate intracellular organisms. So, they can only produce inside a living cell. And so, we say they are not living. They are made up of nucleic acids, uh, specifically they are either DNA or RNA. And they also have a protein coat, which is called a capsid. An example, we have the viruses, the viroids, the prions, and also the lesions. Now, the mode of reproduction of microorganisms may either be sexual or asexual. Now, when we pick the asexual, we have four main types. Uh, there are others, but the, the ones we are going to look over here are the uh, binary fusion, the burden, fragmentation, and pathogenesis or pathogenesis. So, when we say asexual mode of reproduction, it means uh, these organisms uh, require only one parent only one parent yes and so uh, when we pick uh, binary fusion by means you always bring a term by means uh, 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 two and fusion means to divide and so binary fusion to divide it means to divide into two it usually occur uh, you know, in lower plants, uh, also in bacteria, in agar, and also in protozoa. So what happens in binary fusion is that uh, the cell divides after the DNA has divided. And so if <clears throat> the cell divides into two, then we have binary fusion. If it divides more, then we have multiple uh, fusion. For example, if this is the cell with its nucleus and it has some cellular um, inclusions then the cell is going to divide but before that the dna must divide so the dna divides into two we still have our inclusion bodies then once the dna has divided we are going to have the cell also or the cytoplasm also dividing into two so now we have one nucleo, uh, nucleus here, another one here, we still have our inclusion bodies. And finally, we are going to have two separate cells or two daughter cells, each bearing similarity with the parent cell. So this is what we refer to us. Uh, binary uh, fusion. Now, when we talk about burden, burden is found uh, in few unicellular uh, microorganisms such as yeast, sometimes also in bacteria and also in protozoa. And so uh, a small growth, what happens is that there is a small growth on the surface of the parent which breaks off, resulting in the formation of two individual uh, uh, cells. So what happens is that, for example, uh, if this if this is the cell, then we have um, uh, we have a small growth which takes place uh, on the surface of the cell. So this may be a growth like this. So we have another growth over here, and so 
with time, one of the growths will break off. So as it breaks off, it begins to form its own uh, you know, living cell. But it bears characteristics, similar characteristics with the parent cell. Like this. So this one broke off and it's now bearing the same characteristics with the parent cell. Now when we talk about fragmentation, fragmentation is when the uh, organism or the microorganism breaks into two or more fragments or particles which develop into a new individual and usually occurs in plants like you know uh, coral and also in starfish. For example, if you have if you have um, a microorganism like this, you have a microorganism like this, then uh, this part of the microorganism uh, breaks off. So now you have this. Now with time, this part or this fragment of the microorganism further develops to form just like the parent microorganism. And so this is what we call fragmentation. Then uh, finally, we have what we call uh, parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis, in parthenogenesis, an embryo develops from uh, an uh, unfertilized cell. And this usually occurs in invertebrates, and sometimes in fish, amphibians, and also in reptiles. So that is it uh, about each sexual means of reproduction. Yes. Now, when we talk about uh, sexual uh, reproduction, that's what we know. So sexual reproduction is uh, when uh, we use uh, two parents, uh, you know, give us two daughter cells. Two parents give us two daughter cells. So what happens is that in uh, sexual reproduction, <clears throat> each parent contributes a gamete, which is the sex cell. So in men, we have the sperm, and in women, we have uh, you know, the egg. And both contains normal DNA. And so if this uh, is, um, we have a, a female, then we have a male. So the male, the female is going to produce uh, an egg, uh, which is, uh, so this is the egg, as the ovum, which contains 23 chromosomes. The male will also produce the sperm. So the sperm, which also contains 23 chromosomes. Now, the two of them will meet during fertilization and forms a zygote. The zygote still contains 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. And this further develops into an embryo. which contains 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs. So this is what happens in um, sexual uh, reproduction. It's as simple as that. So now that we've seen all about the characteristics of um, uh, cells, we need to look at uh, each of them one by one. And so we have bacteria, which is a prokaryotic. Um, and so now we know what prokaryotic means. So there is no nucleus. And the cell wall of the bacteria is made up of peptidoglycan. Peptid comes from proteins. And glycan comes from what? Glucose. And so it is made up of a complex uh, cellular uh, wall which is made up of proteins and sugars. They reproduce asexually by binary fusion, which we know now, and their DNA is circular. And some are photosynthetic, autotrophic, and others are heterotrophic. When we say photosynthetic um, autotrophs, it means they use the sunlight to manufacture 
their own food so photo means light auto means self and trough means food so they use the sunlight to manufacture their own food others are heterotrophic meaning they cannot use the sunlight or they cannot uh, manufacture their own food and so they depend on other things or other sources for their food and this is a typical example of the bacterial cell wall so these are some of the examples of bacteria we have the staphylococcus we have staphylococcus we have uh, escherichia coli we have lactobacillus we have pseudomonas and streptococcus then we have the archaea which are also uh, prokaryotic cells meaning they don't have any nucleus their cell wall is made up of pseudom their cell wall is made up of pseudomurin they are unicellular they um, reproduce by binary fusion that's asexually their dna is circular and they are extremophiles when we say extremophiles it means um, they're able to tolerate extreme uh, you know, uh, 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 they, they're able to, to they, they're able to tolerate extreme living uh, uh, environment. For example, they are thermophiles. It means they're able to withstand heat, and they are also halophiles. It means they're able to what withstand or they love salt. And they are methanogens. It means they produce methane, which is a waste product of uh, respiration. Then we have a fungi. Uh, finally, which are the eukaryotic cells, which are which has a nucleus. The cell wall has chitin and mannan. We said the chitin and mannan are very important uh, in the diagnosis uh, of fungi infection. You know, said they are heterotrophic. It means they depend on others to make their own food, and most of them are uh, saprobes. It means they uh, live off, you know, uh, decay or dead uh, bodies, and they are unicellular. For example. Uh, fungi which are unicellular include the yeast and the multicellular include the molds and mushrooms and they can reproduce uh, either sexually or asexually and their DNA is linear and this is an example of mold as you can see on the wall on the uh, on the back of the tree and mushroom is an example of a multicellular uh, fungi you have the protozoa which are eukaryotic so they have two cells they lack a cell wall uh, they are usually heterotrophic it means that, that makes them parasitic they depend on other uh, microorganisms for their food they are unicellular one cell they can produce sexually or asexually and they move by pseudophils or pseudopods they are flagellar cilia and some are non-motile and so in this we have examples including the giardia, the plasmodium, the amoeba, and the trypanosoma. And so if you look at the amoeba, these are what we call the pseudopods. These are the pseudopods. And if you look at the giardia, this is the flagella that we have. And some of them have cilia. So there is a cilia. Or even some of them, they have the cilia around them like that. So that is Then we have the algae, which are also eukaryotic. Um, they are cell wall has cellulose which is polysaccharide it means they have it means the cell wall is made up of many sugars then um they are photosynthetic it means they depend on sunlight to make their own food then they are unicellular or multicellular and they can produce either sexually or asexually then we have the viruses which are acellular microorganisms it means they are no they, they, they are non-living they don't have any cells and like we said earlier they are obligate intracellular parasite they cannot live by themselves and they either uh, uh, may be a dna or an rna and they may be enveloped or naked and they may contain a protein code which we call the capsid and so this is an example of the virus on your screen then we have the multicellular uh, animal parasites which are the helminths we talked about them they are free living or parasitic. They may include the uh, flukes, the tapeworms, and the roundworms. They don't have any cell wall. They are heterotrophic. They can reproduce either sexually or asexually. And they have uh, microscopic stages. Now, these are common technologies that I need you to uh, pay attention to. Um, we have the first one to be aerobes when we say aerobes what it means is organisms that grow in the presence of atmospheric oxygen 
so they require oxygen you see anaerobes uh, it means they grow in the absence of free oxygen then when we say facultative anaerobes it means microbes that do not require oxygen for their growth but they do grow in the presence of oxygen then we also have attenuation when we say attenuation um, we mean reducing the virulence uh, uh, of a microorganism but can provoke an immune uh, response then we have pathogen which means any you know virus bacteria or other agents that can cause a disease and when we say pathogenicity it is the ability to cause a disease and virulence is the degree or intensity of the pathogenicity of an organism you also have disinfection which means killing, inhibition, or removal of the microorganisms uh, that may cause a disease. Then we also have sterilization, which is a process by which all living cells, including viable spores, viruses, and viroids, are killed through the use of uh, uh, autoclaving. Then we have bacteremia. When we say bacteremia, it means the presence of viable bacteria in the blood. We say septicemia. It's a severe condition of bacteremia, which includes rapid multiplication of bacteria and toxins in the blood. Pyogenic means uh, an agent which induces fever. Then antibiotic, when we say antibiotic is a substance of microbial origin <clears throat> uh, and its uh, derivatives that kill susceptible microorganisms or inhibit its growth. Finally, we can talk about antibodies, which are also known as immunoglobulins or glycoproteins, which are produced by the body in response to an antigen. And so an antigen is a disease-causing agent. So these are all that I have for you as a way of introduction. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.